Fourth, most important, Kubernetes VSFR is a lot of fun. Um, the last three I co presented, which I meant to take off in, who um, was there, they, um, he, they have a, they're an open source community user of Solo Blue. Um, it's been fun to present with him at his slides, so I can tell you how awesome he thinks the technology is. That's what he's saying. Um, but it's been fun to kind of present with him to have a, an open source community user talk about how they're using the technology. So everything I'm going to talk about, you know, Felix was talking about, I, I can probably pull a couple of dark things as well. Um, so it's sort of Nice if you have an open source product, but somebody's actually using that as opposed to saying, oh, you can't actually use it unless you buy the enterprise thing, but they're actually using the open source ones. That's, that's actually a really nice thing. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, some about API gateways, some about uh, service meshes, you know, some about Envoy, which is the annoying technology stack and that. So hopefully we'll find some of these things. Um, and I'll try and do a couple of demos at the end. So, I have my start with my obligatory, uh, you know, digital transformation slide. I say this because even though I know I presented as a Red Hat the last bunch of years before I joined Solo in January, and everyone talked about this, and I, I continue to be amazed at how much the, the speed continues. And so when I'm talking to people about service mesh or gateways, the, the speed that people need to do is still getting up there, and that's driving a lot more of the IT behavior, which is causing accelerated adoption of services, which is both very cool and kind of scary. Service meshes is a very complex piece of technology on top of everyone thought Kubernetes is hard, and it's like service meshes will be harder. So it's kind of interesting to see that, that dynamic coming along. So relative to that, what, what Solo does, and, and a lot of open source projects that we uh, put out there, Kind of focus on within that um, that space of the microservices around that, and, and kind of a journey that a lot of really single companies or groups within larger companies kind of somewhere on the spectrum. Um, and obviously, Kubernetes beat up, and you know, kind of make the foregone conclusion that a lot of people need. Obviously, people are going to Kubernetes, and why would you go anywhere else? Um, so that's a lot of it. We're seeing sort of uh, on the left part, people starting that journey. They've got existing infrastructure. Some of it works really, really well. They don't want to mess with it too much. Uh, but they do want to kind of modernize their stack in some way, shape, or form. Usually that means that they're going to adopt Kubernetes in some way, shape, or form. And they're going to adopt microservices in some shape, or form. Which usually means they're decomposing their, like, their models in some way, shape, or form. And I'm not going to get into the whole monolith microservice. You must be this small to do it. Not going to go there, but there's a lot of people struggling with that. We've seen a lot of people deal with how do we kind of bridge those two environments? You know, they built out significant infrastructure, you know, on bare metal or VMware or, or up on the cloud on EC2, and they're saying, okay, now we want to start moving some stuff to Kubernetes. Like, how do we do that? Can we let them shift? But even if they do that, I still have other assets I'm going to talk to on platform. Um, you know, or I'm going to be forced to do an unnatural acts, as I say. They have to accelerate development to actually get pieces onto Kubernetes uh, you know, quicker than they're necessarily able to do an application development team. So there's a lot of challenges on that front. We've also seen as people kind of evolve to that, they get, and Felix talks about this at the Tech, they had the same problem. They started using Blue, they had about you know, a couple of five services, they're like, this is pretty cool, we can have manually manage it, this is all great. Well, now they're up to 85. And you know, 85 is a really smart team. They pretty much know what, what all those 85 services are, but they're struggling to even kind of keep track of which service does what, are they all secure, you know, what's the call path through that because they're starting to evolve at different cadences. So that's where service managers start to come in. You know, people are kind of looking at that as a little bit of a silver bullet to kind of come in and help with. Um, so that I can deal with, how can I guarantee that all of my services have secure connections that the services are only talking to the other services that they're supposed to be. Uh, how can I get observability? What's the call graph through that? Uh, how can I do things like more complex traffic shipping? So now my application is actually, instead of microservices, how can I kind of compose those into that application or change that as my application evolves? So that becomes kind of the next challenge that people deal with when looking at service mode. And then as they get even bigger than that, they start thinking about how, what are new ways to be testing? 
around. And so we're going to be employing, you know, let's say, the third challenge that a lot of people deal with. Because the testing environment should get to a highly microservice environment, maybe you all know this, you know, that becomes a problem because, because teams are evolving at different rates, you don't actually know if your microservice is actually going to work until you put it in the production environment because the set of connections that it's going to have with the data flow through it is, is almost kind of unique in that production environment. So you don't really know once you get there, so people now start doing much more complex deployment patterns. They want to deploy it, they want to send a small fraction of their uh, user traffic to it to make sure that it's actually live or a lot more. They want to start doing like chaos engineering around that. So I want to actually test it. What happens if I have a slow connection between a couple of services? How does that impact my app? It's kind of hard to do functional testing around that, but what happens there? What happens if a down, you know, an upstream or downstream service stops responding? You know, so the idea of using chaos testing on a microservice, which service meshes can help you with, we'll talk a little bit more about how they help you with. But if you've got that, then you can do some very interesting things. And that way you can kind of do your resilience testing nine to five when all of your engineers are in the office and know that a test is going on, as opposed to doing the chaos engineering test at two in the morning on Saturday when you don't want dealing with it. Uh, and so doing that hard name and resilience testing is kind of important. So that's a lot of the technology that the kind of the space we've been focused on. We've got a set of projects or products that we've been dealing with that. I'll, I'll talk probably most about, about Glue, which is, which is dealing with sort of a, a sliver of, I want to call it a mini search event, but it, it deals with a lot of overlap and I'll explain what I mean by that. So I'll talk some about that. I'll talk about um, some of the work we're doing around the service mesh. I'll, demo this more and talk about it. Um, but this is an area we've been working with. Um, we're trying not to be another sort of special world already has it too many. Um, you know, Istio, App Mesh, Linkerd, Console, uh, Asset Mesh. I mean, there's a bunch that are already kind of out there and there's a bunch that are kind of growing into that space. So the world does not need another. But what we've seen is a lot of people are saying, well, that's, you know, deploying one of these is hard. Deploying one of these for cluster and having to deal with that is harder. Having to deal with, and we've seen, we've talked to, I think I've talked to one customer that has six different service mesh technologies, same technology that they're dealing with in that environment. They're like, how do we manage that? We've got a couple of homegrown to deal with that mesh and the CEO and they're like, what do we do? So we've done some work in that space. Um, we've been really, we're really excited at KubeCon Barcelona. Uh, we partnered up with Microsoft. They took some of the Abstraction and translation layer that we had built out on top of um, the four major service meshes and started working with the vendors around the service mesh interface. So, this is a standard uh, abstraction tier for all service meshes uh, that Microsoft was helping us work with, getting you know, VMware and Red Hat and uh, Hashi and others were kind of jumping on board with this and creating adapters so that this at least. You know, like when Kubernetes came in, there's a lot of different technologies that came in. People had struggle over which one do I pick, which is the right one. So this this is kind of helping lay a little bit of a fear on that. You can build some automation against the standard API that all of the mesh vendors are going to be behind, uh, and that can kind of help you. Uh, and then Dr. Blue does some of the, the chaos engineering stuff. That's pretty new. Um, definitely play with it on solo, and I'm going to talk about it uh, today. But that's sort of I call that sort of the post service mesh world. You know, it's like once you adopt service mesh, then you yeah, I'm not sure if it doesn't matter. Let me stop for a second. Who's, who has done anything with a service mesh? Like, it's here. Who's like, got an introduction? Okay, no one. Oh, that's cool. You should let me know again. Kind of on the introduction. You're playing it. We have several departments, one of them, which is. Okay. Anybody else kind of playing with this year or at mesh? Okay, three people. So that's. That's even typical, of, you know, that, that's pretty uncommon. Now. So I usually get a couple of people that say, yeah, you know, we're close to actually we get a small production deployment of it. There's a bunch of people that are going to take the tires and maybe six to nine months away from doing anything with it. Other people are like, I heard about it. Um, who's sure of Envoy? Nobody is. Okay, cool. So after. So Envoy tends to, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this um, as I get into it. So I, I like to engage a little bit, so I don't want to bore people and I don't want to know this. So, let me start with this. So, um, what is the API? And why am I talking about that? So, this, a lot of people in the Kubernetes world will know this you know, ingress controllers. Um, can, can 
nominally only a gateway to basically ingress or get you know, ex exit, egress from uh, a cluster to kind of deal with it. So an ingress, you know, is obviously the entry point, standard part of the user's cluster, to deal with it. That's a common case for it. Uh, if that gateway is kind of extend that a little bit, uh, Nginx is kind of the classic one that most people in the Kubernetes community know about. The open source version has kind of been, in fact, not been there, included a lot of technologies. So when you start saying, hey, I want to do more sophisticated uh, routing to my services, you know, the ingress, rather than just saying, hey, all traffic or basic route, I want to start doing a little more header based routing or, you know, TLS, um, well, TLS is part of the standard, but if I want to do some more, you know, path rewriting, things like that, they start to slide into kind of what people nominally call a dead game. Um, and so it's kind of more sophisticated patterns. Gateways also kind of can play a role in the native. The native first, I also have a little time talking about that. Um, so within the K-native world, a lot of what it's doing, when it started, it was it, uh, leveraged heavily on this year. Now, what it needed was traffic shipping capabilities. Why did it need traffic shipping capabilities? Right? You know about K-native, the whole idea of it is that it can scale the service down to zero and scale them back up when somebody calls. Kind of function, you know, service, service on demand, I would say function as a service, but Services, services um, coming into it. So to have this thing scale down, scale back up, you need some level of kind of traffic shifting. I'm going to send a request to that service actually to uh, an adapter, you know, activator service that's going to go and look and say, hey, is this service actually running or not? Started it, it's not, and then route the request to that service. So they started with this deal basically to use traffic shifting. It's cool, this deal does a nice job at it. It's got about 40 other services behind it, and so it's this big monster that people had to deploy, kind of deal with just a sliver of what they wanted. So Google reached out to us, and we became Google became the second alternate implementation to do that. Because we basically just do, basically, you know, we're using Envoy and covers, which is the same technology that Istio uses, and we've got you know just that focused sliver of it, so we can do the traffic shifting on a much later rate of way. So they added us in for the cool in that seven release, and now the diet is they've added in Nginx and Faster and other technologies. So there's a lot of choice. So that was pretty cool. One of our engineers did a lot of work. In fact, we just did a webinar today with the K-Native community uh, earlier today, which has been recorded, actually, that um, talking about the work that was done. So one of our engineers did a lot of the work to kind of open up those APIs so that our competition could come in and go underneath as well. That's all. Um, so it's all open source. So that's opened up. And then hybrid architecture. Um, I'm sorry if I'm talking a little longer. I feel like we started in Montreal and there were like five speakers that we had that day. So it's like, rush, rush, rush. And it's totally become less. I don't want to bore you or take too much time, but uh, look, I'm feeling less pressure to really <laughs> scramble through here. So tell me to shut up if I start rambling too much. Hybrid architecture is, again, going to that core case that we talked about. A lot of people will start to look at API gateways to deal with that. I've got stuff in different platforms. VMware, bare metal, other technology stacks, and I'm looking to kind of get some stuff on Kubernetes, and how do I kind of bridge those worlds? Um, and so we've seen a lot of people using Glue to kind of help with that. Because um, it can run off Kubernetes. I know what Kubernetes means, you know, why would you do that? But it can't run there, it can run on Kubernetes itself. So a lot of what we're we kind of based on is on what we'll talk a little bit about on what you Half you said you know about it, half you don't. So Envoy is a, is, a, is a data proxy layer. So people call it the data plane and service mesh plan and we'll start talking about data planes and control planes. Um, so the idea is that Envoy is, is, is this data plane for a lot of it. So it handles all the heavy lifting of the request traffic coming in. Um, and it can do, it comes out of Lyft. So Lyft built this, which is not on Kubernetes, not using the uh, service mesh. They just wanted a proxy technology to handle their kind of growing traffic a lot of them kind of re-architect their system into effectively a microservice architecture, but not, not in Kubernetes, not whatever. Now they've adopted, I believe they've adopted Kubernetes since then, and they're starting to look at SEO going beyond that. Um, so part of the, the magic that happened with Envoy is when they were building up, they made a decision. So a lot of people, a classic example is the Netflix OSS library stack. A lot of people, when they were, were doing these kind of larger architectures, use libraries to do things like service discovery, to do retries, to do circuit breaking, uh, 
uh, to do some traffic shifting that capability. So all of those were baked into Python. And of course, OSS is going to be one of the, the more famous, popular ones of the Java community. You know, did a really nice job on that front. Um, and that's great if you're using Java. But if you're using Node.js, well, something else. If you're using Go, well, something else. Um, and that became a problem for people um, as they scale up. So one of the libraries does it a little bit differently. So now, you know, yeah, you gain some capabilities, but whoops, you know, everything does it different. Now I get to deal with what those differences are. And a lot of, at least some of the people I talked to, also found that there was a sort of a, a challenge that came with success. The more that they deployed that out, the more, you know, when they get hundreds of thousands of services using those libraries, if they needed to roll a service patch out, they had to redeploy every single app that adopted those libraries, which means they generally had to read QA and retest it. It was a nightmare of a problem, and the more they spread it up, the more that became a problem. Yeah. If you are using ASP.NET Core, yeah. do I need the, the proxy? Well, so let me get to what the proxy itself does. So if it works with ASP Core. So what, what the Envoy group says is that, hey, instead of Instead of doing all of this library, let's move this down as a network tier application. So it's now application level network, which will allow the to see that work to see that as well. So now it's just a network function. Okay. I can call to it, and the proxy is going to do all of those capabilities. So it can retries and search, search discoveries, search array, and stuff like that. So now it's a separate component it's using the network stack as the interaction layer. So now I don't have to worry about it. Everyone, anybody who talk to the network, gain those capabilities. So we become kind of an application level networking tier. People talk about this as a level seven proxy. So it's an application messaging aware proxy. Um, and, and, and it has an extensibility capability. It's a filter chain architecture, so they allow to create filters on it. So when they built this out, so they said that was one core design. If they were going to pull this in, now we don't have to worry about language. If they had like Python and Node, and C++ for their language they use it with, and they built this. So they already were kind of facing some of these problems, and they said, well, we just want to deal with it. Um, they built Envoy, so one, of the designs really, really cool and allowed service meshes to do a lot of magic. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, they also built all of this in C++, because they wanted it to be super fast and predictable. Um, they also made sure that they looked at the latency impact so that they didn't want it to be like 80% of the traffic would be super fast and some of it would be like, oh, well, you know, you're screwed if you're in that, you know, 10 to 20%. They actually went up like 98.9, you wanted to make sure it was sort of a very predictable, uh, you know, impact overhead impact across the whole curve. So they used C++ to kind of tune it, tweak it down to a very low level, uh, which is really cool. And because of this, Matt Klein, the original, is still kind of the, the voice of Envoy, um, he made a very active decision to not create a company app. And it was kind of crazy when like, oh, you know, he thought it was a project to create a company app. He didn't. He actually said he didn't want to do that. Um, he spoke very passionately about why he didn't want to do it. And it's actually played out like he said because everyone jumped on to using Envoy because it's a very high open source community. So I think about two years ago when it launched, they had an Envoy conference and, you know, maybe had this many people. And uh, you know, the first Envoy at like, Kubecon, they had kind of a crowd of there was a couple hundred people. The last Kubecon, there was about a thousand people the day before Kubecon to do Envoy. Con. So it's already like a thousand people just kind of focused on this community, and they're expecting a few thousand at San Diego. Uh, just for the Envoy part of the Kubernetes conference, never mind the 15,000 or the Kubernetes conference itself. So it's kind of cool. Uh, so this is kind of the data point. So this is the magic, and Glue would be a wise to the gateway. So we base Glue on um, this particular technology um, because we felt like that was a vibrant community. We wanted to layer that. We wanted to be kind of a forward-looking architecture. Um, and it also helps people adopt the service mesh because it's the same technology. I'm going to talk about that in a second. We also wanted to make sure that the product worked really well for next. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we embraced um, custom resources right out of that. So we, we did that. Um, we built a control architecture uh, around it. We did not use the, so it's a, it basically it's like an operator style. We didn't use the core OS operator SDK. We built 
our own because when we were building it, we didn't know what that was. Um, and we also used a lot of Vertibot technology as well, which actually helped us with dealing with off Kubernetes uh, environments at the same time. Uh, but that's not so, so we did that, we made sure that we did implement a full, you know, compliant control as well. Um, and we also did a lot of integration with, with other technologies like console, uh, which is used a lot in not Kubernetes based deployments as a service register. So we made sure that even when Blue was deployed on a Kubernetes environment, we could talk to console for all of the services it's described. I can demo, I will demo console, but I'll show you it doing service discovery and calling on the services outside of the file, which is really powerful. Um, we can also use console, if you are using console, but not in Kubernetes, we can use console um, for the service registry and for storage as well. So when we're in Kubernetes, we use that CD. We're using console resources. So everything is stored in SD, you might have to do a separate database. That's cool, right? It's safe. If you're not on Kubernetes, you can actually use console as a key value store because um, it's, it's highly available on the game. So it's pretty cool. Um, so with this, with this kind of architecture and, and kind of layering, uh, I'm just going to talk in the slide, but just to kind of tie these things together. So basically, what we built with Blue is kind of like a mini control plane. Well, it is a control plane for Envoy. Um, without all of the other services, if you're familiar with HD or things like that, it's got a lot of certificate rotation capabilities and others. So we don't have all of the services, but we've got a control plane to, to manage Envoy. I didn't talk about that Envoy itself, but Envoy beyond being super cool and fast, it's highly configured, dynamically configured. So it has a, has a mechanism to kind of push and dig to it at runtime, and it's built to do that very well. So you can change security, configuration, everything dynamically. You know, on the fly, so we built that deal with kind of architecture. So Glue is acting as a control plane to push those configurations down to Envoy. So Envoy is doing all the heavy lifting, and Glue is acting on a control plane. So if you make a change, it kind of gets some your pushes the policy changes down, and it kind of gets out of the way. And then you can have one, two, three, four, five, however many proxies you want um, in your architecture. And this can grow. Again, this becomes a, I used to talk about it as a, the stepping stone for people moving up to, we found a lot of people that are interested in looking at service engines, and that's really cool, but it's a lot to digest. Some people pick it up and fine, but some people are saying, whoa, I just want people to be so I just want this, I don't want all this other thing. So we found some people have kind of looked at Blue to kind of pull, pull back a little bit, to get some operational experience with Envoy, so they can get one or two instances out, figure out what that is, deal with immediate pain points, and then they want to jump to a full service, that's great, go do that. Um, and that's kind of a cool, it's a cool hack that we're starting to see. Um, and so that kind of touches a little on this point. So we're seeing with Blue itself, the service is still very uh, compatible with service engines. You can still work them together. Um, there's still kind of a separation of concerns. Uh, we'll talk about North South, East West kind of traffic. North South is sort of in and out of the cluster. Traditional yeah. management or gateways to ingress tends to fall in that space. The concern is what's coming in, what's coming out. Security tends to be a big concern in that front and uh, focus area. So some people are, are still using ingresses like Blue um, to deal with that, even with the service mesh. The service mesh is more about service to service. You know, that kind of east west. How do I make sure that? And it's managed both. I've got hundreds of thousands of microservices. I need help with all of that communication back and forth. How do I make sure that? Services that are supposed to call the services are doing that, secure, um, you know, observability, things like that. Um, serverless, I talked a little bit about. We, with Glue technology, we actually, I talked about the PA part, but we also call out to functions. Uh, I'll show you that in a second. Um, we call out to Lambda. So we, we didn't make the building block post support in a traditional service. We actually made it function call. So if you have a Swagger or an API definition, or if you're using GRPC, we can say, oh, okay, you've got functions. We can actually route to an individual function, and you can kind of specify that. Yeah? Uh, and train from a uh, Microsoft uh, stack point of view, uh, what, uh, are you familiar what uh, of your features uh, the Azure platform covers? I mean, if, if I limit myself on Azure, Kubernetes, and ISP.NET Core, yeah. uh, 
is there any case when I need the glue or proxy? Uh, if if Azure, uh, I don't know, I'm not familiar. If uh, some some of the features. As an ingress, it deals with like their Kubernetes service or managed Kubernetes service, uh, blanking on the ingress. They, they do have ingress technology that's in there. Uh, they don't have a recommended gateway. Uh, and Microsoft hasn't taken a position on a, a specific service <laughs> technology either at this point. Uh, though they're, they're focused more on the, the SMI, you know, the, the interface, the API definitions is where the Azure team is kind of focusing on. So they have to take a position, and all of this would work with ASP, of course. It's just a network. As long as you call a network, you're good. Because all this is doing is just proxy network connections in and out of your application. So you know, as long as you have the ability, and ASP has absolutely the ability to use the network, you know, that's fine. And it will all just work. Both, both Glue as a technology, as well as service engines in general, will all just work. It's just what's really cool about it. I'm just uh, concerned about overlapping. You know, if uh, maybe there are features in Azure yeah. that cover part of uh, okay. what you're describing here. That's, uh, um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, there's a little bit again. There's an ingress controller that, that I think they got recommended in there. All of many Kubernetes platforms have a default. Um, you know, Amazon, Google, in particular, I know that they have. I'm sure Azure has this as well. They all have an external load balancer technology that tends to. to have a, a ingress component attached to it so that when you deploy stuff into it, it'll automatically associate a file load balancer um, as an ingress point to your cluster. You can specify that if you deploy a Kubernetes service by load balancer, you know, all the major clouds will automatically spin up a, uh, an external load balancer to connect to it, which is name I mean, that, that's, that's what ingress technology is doing, so we'll map that. So in that sense, it will do it, but it tends to be a, a static route at that point. Create an external point and deal with that service, but you don't have the ability to say, well, the header, you know, if I get this foo header and I set it to red, I actually want this message to go over here, but if it's blue, I want to go over there. Most of them don't have that level of regularity. It's just they do a very nice job on how do I, I run, I've got this deploy of multiple availability zones in multiple regions. They do an awesome job. You should definitely use the cloud load balancers for that because they're, they're deeply integrated. You're going to get a lot of services on that front. There's a lot of uh, web application firewall technology that's built into a lot of those little bounces. There's a lot of good things there, but they don't have the granularity. Most of them typically don't have the granularity to say, okay, now I'm in my cluster. You know, how do I want to very granularly route the rest of the requests to my application? Or really, with like CRD based technology, we found a lot of people start version controlling the configuration with their app. So version one of my app, I want the request to go to this service. Version two of the app, I want this specific type of request to go over here. And so if I deploy it, I need to deploy that, that routing rule has to deploy the app. If I roll it back, I need to roll back that configuration. Most of the load balancers won't do that. You actually have to set up Terraform, Ansible, other script platforms, other scripts to do a lot of that. In general, again, I, you know, Azure, they all have nuances around how to work. I don't know if that answers your question, but Thanks. Um, you know, it's, more, it's always going on. This is a very, everyone I'm talking to, it's like, everyone's seeing this as a very fast moving world. And most of like, even on the, the ingress and the sort of the API management technologies, Apogee, people saw, uh, layer so some of those were all kind of evolving rapidly, trying to figure out a new position around some of this, adopting Envoy as a data point technology. You know, Apogee's doing that as for Google. Tom's rewriting onto Nginx, you know, so all of these technologies are kind of suddenly scrambling because they're realizing that the landscape is, is changing pretty fast. And so I expect it will be slow enough for a while, and it's confusing. Uh, but I'm also seeing the pain seems to, again, that kind of this dynamic seems to be pushing the adoption surge much, much faster than, than I would have expected, given its level of complexity. I would have expected it to be on a two to three year trajectory, and it's like, People are like, no, no, I gotta, I need something, I need help on this right now. Uh, so they're all kind of diving into it. Um, yeah, I talked about both of these points. Um, put this in, you know, a lot of it's open source, like I said. Um, Felix is in here, I'll talk a little bit about what he said. Um, Carol testified that by live, you know, she'll tell Felix. 
show it to one other time. Again, but um, and there's a recording of one of them actually here in the talk. You know, so, so he's using the open source version of um, DTAC Montreal, basically, HR company, which is awesome. You know, use it. Um, so he's done that. And then there is an enterprise version if you want to help you feed my children. Um, we sell you know, support services around that. Um, we've got things like a web user interface, a lot of the product will work out the, the command line, and there's a web interface and things like that. Um, some of the deeper security capabilities we've got built in. You want to help you feed my children? But the open source is really cool too, which is very easy to use that as well. Um, okay, way too much talking. Let me, let me, let me go to the, that's, that's always the exciting part. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to give two examples. One, I'm going to talk about Blue and a sort of monolith case to microservice. So if you're replatforming, and I'll do another demo um, showing service mesh on managing multiple uh, service meshes. We'll do that soon too. That's a little bit of information. So I'm using this my model that some people are laughing at using you know, the pet spring pet clinic, which is spring boots, spring boots. Hot and cool, how can how can call that legacy? You know, okay, it's a model of the application. <laughs> you know, it's a single process kind of application. Spring boots are really cool, I like spring boot, not knocking spring boot, but you know, it's not a microservice architecture. Uh, this application, uh, so I'm using this thing. Okay. For a while. Um, I took this and I, I just threw it, I literally just forked the, the spring peg clinic thing, threw a container around it, and then, you know, deployed it. So there's no code generation, no other magic happening here. Uh, there's a MySQL database as well. If this, if this demo would work equally well if spring peg clinic was running off platform, not on Kubernetes, and I was calling it from something. So it's just easier for me to deploy it. Um, so we got our app. Got a SQL database, my SQL database behind it. Um, you know, so we can look at different capabilities. Now, say the business comes and says, hey, this is cool, you have two columns, but I really want to add a city column. Just want to add a third column. Okay, you know, not that hard. I don't have to figure that out. I can figure out add it on a release cycle, probably in the you know, month, couple months release cycle. I can figure that out just to say, okay, I really want this now. Okay, you know, and the whole negotiation is all that, right? So, what if, you know, let's say someone on the team says, hey, you know, like, I'm really digging this go line stuff. You know, and I got really excited last night. I wrote a go line app to generate that third column against that. And I got it. I already wrote it. Oh, cool. How the heck do I take my job out and tell it to go to this? I'm going to read the gray app. So that's the story you guys gave me. I'm going to get it. So it turns out my gray app, right? So let me go and show you the, the glue application. So this is a web interface. Everything I'm going to show you here, you can also use the command line. This is what it feels, does on the other um, So some of the capabilities here, we, we, we're deploying, in this case, there's just one envoy proxy that I deploy um, into my cluster. And it'll tell you, it'll read circles, meaning that it's happy. If I had particularly multiple proxies, and for some reason one of them didn't pick up the latest configuration, remember I said that, you know, the control plane technology is going to change that push it big out, and then we kind of validate that it actually takes. Sometimes it doesn't. The network picks up, something, the process is overloaded, whatever. This will start to tell you, hey, it's not like you expect. Do you kind of manage that? Um, we have a concept of upstream, so we will launch service discovery. Um, we talked about that, right? It's sort of an ongoing thing that it does service to help you with service discovery. We plug in. So we can pick up all of the Kubernetes based services that are deployed. Um, one of the good examples I'll show you on here. I also registered in AWS. So I am a register. This is all deployed on Google, you know, GKE. But I, I told that, hey, I also gave some credentials to Amazon. Um, and in my Amazon cluster, I've actually got six Lambda functions. So it went out, it connected, it found, hey, you've got six Lambda functions. You can route them. They're available. They're part of the network. Cool. Um, and if I had some Swagger based um, you know, function that had Swagger here, you can see it would also show those functions as well. And we can do that for that. So I'll show you what that what I mean by that. So Glue, like Istio, has this kind of concept of virtual services. So the idea that I can create a service proxying other services. Hey, proxy, I said that a few times. Proxy, you can proxy services. Proxy services would be another name for this. Um, I've created a default one. 
So it's right now it's got a slash that's saying all traffic versus right on the boundary of lines. You can't really see it, but it's cool. Um, trust me. So the slash is basically saying all traffic right now is going to the tectonic application, to the job application. Okay, cool. So going in, classic Angers app, right? Set this up. But now I have, remember I have my mess app. Cool kid came on and said, hey, I can just go with that. So I want to take the sliver, and so my application, probably can't really see it, but there's like a best.html uh, as part of the, the query path. So I'm going to go in here with one hand. It's uh, too easy to do one hand. <laughs> so I'm going to tell it, you know, you know, of all of the upstreams in town, I'm going to say, you know, go to the best one. So this is my go line application. I'm going to tell it, if any path, well, you can see it. If any path or prefix to the best, and I can do exact match, I can reg it, I can do whatever I want, I can put headers, and here I can say the headers match, or I can do very sophisticated. In this case, I'm just going to say any prefix to the best, send those to some other service. And, oh, whew. The pause there, and I was like, oh, my God, it's crash. Um, so what I did not, what I didn't have here, so we're not going to have that much of a second. So we did that, I'll go back to my best page, and I'll refresh it. Didn't change the app. Glue is now catching those requests to, to slash vest and sending them to the go thing. But the, anything else is now going back to the job application. So now, just, you know, so I can deploy this out, I didn't have to change the job application. And I'm proud of it. I said, okay, it's not super magic, but it, it allows for application on the team to like this because now the Java team didn't have to do anything unnatural to get this in. And as soon as the service works, you know, everyone's happy with the best thing, great, they can start to, at the pace that they're ready to, strip out that capability from the job application and put more support into the other. Which is great, because now the development can move at a different pace from the business application, which is a really, really cool thing. And you're getting experience in a controlled way with new technologies. So you can get a taste of that at the rate your company is ready to do. You know, all of us in technology would love to move super fast, but we don't know. Ready to kind of like, oh yeah, we'll just rewrite everything in Rust. Rust is a difficult thing. Rewrite everything in Rust. You know, that would be awesome. I'm not going to do it. Um, so I also talked about, like, in this particular app, like, oh, you know, the contact page is going to be Well, I got a random function that does that, so I'll show you that as well. So it's not just that you're calling Kubernetes based ones. I can do, like I said, function based routing to things outside of the platform, which gets people really cool because, again, in that experimentation, it's not only just playing with my services, but I can actually play with different architecture styles. I can play with serverless, I can call it main data. I can start to again play with entirely different application approaches. So in this case, contact form three is my lambda function that happens to generate it returns HTML. Or at least the function generates that. But does anybody play with lambda? What is the response to that? Is it HTML? It returns JSON. All from Lambda, the JSON can include HTML, but the actual response from the Lambda function itself tends to be JSON. Yeah. And there's one of the keys that has a lot of, I hope so, that I know it's correct, so I, this is what I prioritize. Yeah. Um, so you can have the body as the value returned from your function. So there's a, a, a JSON object, one of the keys in the JSON is called body, that body is the value of your function. Okay, well that's cool. But this isn't going to work because I need it to, I, I'm going to rewrite the, the contact page and I'm going to expect it to render as HTML. So like, it's JSON, I don't want to say JSON, I'll do that. So another cool thing about a proxy is that I can put lightweight, you know, it's not an integration platform, you can do transformation in here. So we build like a little transformation engine because this is such a common use case. You know, we've just got this checkbox as a single configuration, so it does exactly that. It says, oh, well, you go find, you know, I'm expecting the response to JSON, and I'm going to look at the body here, and I take the value, and I'm going to replace the response body, the HTTP package, and I'm going to replace the body with the value from that thing. You can also do header manipulation as well, but we're not going to do that. Um, we'll add that in. Call Lambda, so then we call it. You know, we've got now an application, we get Lambda, we get Go, we get Java. Cool. And if 
I wanted to, you know, like I said, I said, hey, the best thing is just, I was happy to call. So I just wait down. Didn't work, go back to some mug or whatever. Go back to my best page. I could do So I don't have to change my app. I can do this again. So then you add a role and delete a role. It's pushing the configuration to on board. Yeah. So underneath the covers, um, what it's doing is we're sending a custom resource. We have a custom resource called version service that we deploy at. We define these route matching rules um, that are part of it. Okay, I'm going to simple out. Okay. 
like to employ your own boy cool holes. So great. Now we'll go to the next level. Now I want to go you know, play with the full service kind of thing. So we've got a, a read-only you know, version of um, of this technology, the service mesh hub, service mesh hub dot IO. You can play with it as a read-only version of that application. So in this case it's deployed on Android. <coughs>
you say, anytime I enroll a new version of my, of my pods out, my containers, it will kind of grab control and say, if you gave me a policy, you told me that you only want in 10 minute intervals, you want to run out 10% of the user traffic to the new version. So kind of behind the scenes, it spins up, if these are existing services there, it spins up the new version, you know, separately. Um, it will start routing, it will use, but, you know, usually ACO would be blue, it use other technologies, again, that traffic shipping. It will route 10% of the traffic there, and then it will watch the previous stats, and you can find healthy. So if it says within 10 minutes, everything stays healthy based on what you said. You know, 99% of the responses have to be 200 or whatever you want. Then it will say, great, we'll run another percent, and another percent. And then you can say, okay, 50, I feel good, then it's actually safe, so then just cut it over. You know, and just do a full rolling upgrade. I wish Jason would shut down, shut down the roll service and do a full rolling upgrade of the original service to the new version. I can get out of the way. Which is kind of cool because you can find policies that anytime you upgrade, you can say run through this kind of generic point. And you can vary it based on you know deployment by deployment, which is kind of cool. But it needs to know where to do that, it needs to know where the service mesh is that's deployed, that's going to the traffic shipping, and it needs to know what Prometheus instance is connected to that service mesh. Because those can be different. You may not be using the version of Prometheus that comes with this DOI and configure it to my instance. So those get changed. So we built a template engine on top of this so that things that depend on that, um, you can install. So I can tell it, hey, you know, I want this particular version of the flyer. Because I clicked it from, I jumped into Istio, Clicked on the extensions, it only showed me the extensions relevant to this code. Um, you know, I can pick that version. They also did a version that's based on the super cool itself, so they based on they used us as kind of the SMI interface um, for that. So they have a flavor, we'll use that, I'm partial to that. Um, you see a little bit of like kind of the template you can explain to cover. So it'll say, hey, if you want to hard code or read this, it's great, otherwise I'm going to look at the one that is here set up to it. Because I use those metrics. Um, and then I can just install that as well. You can also do demos and this is going to lead you the store app, which is the canonical issue thing, you can solve that as well. Um, so it makes it kind of easy to kind of pick the tire. So we're expanding this to add more the operational control around that as well. Um, so that's, that's the demos I have. I'm happy to give Felix a spot and say, oh, wonderful blue, and that was a great as well. I'll take Thank questions you. as well, if they're better. Uh, is there any uh, success story that you can tell us what they use? to achieve something? <laughs> if Felix was here, like, uh, I'll bring up the slide. I'll tell you how wonderful he said it was. Did he ask you to ask the question? I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. But I'm so happy you did. So I did his slide, but it's like, see, see, if I was Felix, I can't do his accent. Um, but, you know, he, he's, he's using it there. He's our application out of a uh, company in Montreal. He's the CTO. He's co-presenting the other three meetups that he talks about that. Um, I'll, put, I'll put his banner up. You should all use, you know, their HR company based in Montreal. You should definitely all check them out. Awesome company. Please send them business. Fabulous, fabulous partner. We love to continue to work with him. Um, he has, I don't, but I'm not going to do justice for what his business does, so I'm not going to talk about that. They're using Blue internally for kind of routing traffic to their microservices. They're about 8590 microservices that are deployed um, in their application right now. They're using Blue, they roll out a new version of that service to kind of route to it to do um, some of the observability measures to make sure that it's all healthy. Um, they're, and they're now looking to ex expand that. They actually had some. Here's his, his success metric. So they're deployed in GKE right now. The GKE is a, uh, this is a startup group within, within DTAC, so they gave a whole bunch of credits. They're like, great, I love Google because they gave us a whole bunch of money to use the stuff for free. And once that runs out of them, I'll see who we lost next. Uh, but they get portability, so they can go to Amazon or, or, or Azure. Um, they get a, a multi region deployment. Um, he was saying 50 were the slides, and one of his engineers corrected him, I think, in Toronto and said, no, it's 85. They get multiple languages, they get 1,000 requests a second going through the system right now, through Blue, um, into the system. So they, they've had a lot of success. Um, you know, 
particularly allowing and some basic um, TL information to the region of the SSL um, kind of connectivity. And what they want to go against is they're looking at native. And again, these are slides. You know, they want to go to native. They want to start looking at uh, mutual TLS. They want to start looking at Istio too, because the number of services they have is so big. They actually want better. And given that they're dealing with HR data, they want to make sure that all the sorts of service communication is very, very secure. So looking at picking up uh, Istio to do mutual TLS, um, kind of east-west. Um, they're looking at the upgrade limit. They want to put a pricing plan in place. They actually want to have tiers of customers and sort of the volume kind of managed by glue in terms of how many requests per second are coming in, which is another great use of the API gateway to put that up front as opposed to trying to layer that on all of your services. Um, and he always actually said that, you know, having seen the demo with the, the UI coming out, he's like, oh, this is really cool. His words were, I think, he said on the command line, they can do stuff, and it took about a minute and a half to make some of these changes. So I mean, it's pretty easy to have this routes. He's like, but, like, he's watching me every day. It's like 10 seconds, you're adding a new like, Cool. He's like all day long. They're making changes. They roll out test versions and things. They're they're constantly changing routes to develop the application and deploy it. So he's like, that you know, is really cool. So he's actually kind of thinking about the enterprise version on that. He cornered me afterwards and said, Hey, because we did all these presentations with you, can we get the extended trial for like a year or two? Is that kind of cool? So we'll figure that out. But um, there, see, so we have a reference. I had slides prepared and stuff. That's what Felix said, right? right? See Carol's line, so she's seen it. I, I'm surprised she's not asleep. She's heard me say this. She's talked four times now. She sold and smiles when I joke, so she's really nice. But the package you're asking about, you know, I'll give you the money in the back. Any other questions? So, uh, so you, you were saying that um, Felix and DTEC use the CRD or the command line to do the, their management of glue. And then you also have this front end UI. I assume that the U front end UI is watching, and so if something gets pushed to Kubernetes over here, it'll show up in the UI over there. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So you can have different, like you can have your your Git deploy doing some of the management, and then your humans doing some of them, and they don't yeah. interfere. Are you going to a Rack HUI, um, type script, and we've got an API server that we built in that, that does the event for us. We do a lot with um, GraphQL. We did an early, when we originally built Blue, we actually put a GraphQL, um, since we were doing function level routing, so we had all the access to the REST services, we actually did an initial implementation of GraphQL on top of that. We said, hey, that would be kind of cool if I could do queries into any one of these services that Blue is dealing with. Um, we haven't evolved that technology, the service much stuff kind of took our attention to a lot of our, our time on that. But Joining GraphQL, we're one of the founding members of the GraphQL Foundation. I think that's cool. We spent time to put more effort in there, trying to. We need to do a little bit more work with auto stitching the schemas across the different services that we discover. That's the last bit of the match. Otherwise, you have to put specifics there. We have to have people who are more fantasy about it. GraphQL is cool. We want to play with it. I mean, there's a there's a sub project called Loop or Scoop, excuse me. That's a uh, Got here with the ice cream cone scoop, so it does graph you all on top of it. So, that was uh, related to GraphQL, but I have another one. Oh, okay. I answered it without knowing. Awesome. <laughs> so, what's uh, your relationship with uh, Cloud Native Initiative Foundation? Um, so, we're, we're part of that. We're, we're under the Cloud Native Foundation. We're, uh, you know, Felix talks about it. He, he had in his slides. Made a comment about that with. Let's put it in this slide. Um, I'll leave this one up though. So if you want to contact Felix, if you don't believe me, you can contact him and do it. And if you wanted to um, play with our stuff, there's links to the trial and you can come to our public slack um, as well. We're very, very active in that, in that front. Um, Felix actually said that's a chunk of why they picked Blue because the, the community is so active. Um, so we're part of the Cloud Native Foundation. Um, you know, so in fact, the question we're listed in the big, you know, the big ecosystem of graph, we're, we're listed in a couple of spots there. Um, you know, and I think it's sister project. It's another Linux Foundation, one of the GraphQL Foundation part of that as well. So we're, we're also part of that too. We do not take this thing. I, I've been doing open source for a very long time. I was a Red Hat before for seven years. I was going to build source, which is a lot of Apache Camel for one year. I'm a big leader, I'm a big leader, I just have to be a ecosystem partnership. Not that I can find 
Operations City or everything, but I think the fact that they're pulling that together is a way to have um, non-single vendor governance over open source systems like Kubernetes and things, I think is really, really important. Otherwise, having watched the Linux wars of eons back when you know, the Linux, the Unix Foundation was up there, and, um, so, um, I feel that. Good automatically define it, you have to define, you have to at some point define how you want requests routed to what service. I mean, right, but that requires human intervention at that point to say how I want to do that. But absolutely, we've got some people that are using Helm, they're packaging this up, they're putting a, a dependency requirement on the glue chart as well as others and they're deploying that out. Some are using Flux to do a GitHub style deployment, so they're rolling that out and they're doing all of their changes, they, they commit the, the CRDs, they, they're just YAML files, right, the, the manifests. So anytime they want to change a routing rule, you know, through Flux, there's a, there's a workflow that goes in, I have to commit that to a Git repository, and then it pushes it automatically, you know, with no human touch points, it pushes it out to the Kubernetes cluster. So that way you know you have a, a, an audit trail and, a, and a, an ability to kind of roll back Git you know, to, to manage that. So I've seen both styles um, that people have deployed, but at some point, well, and there's a third style I've also seen where, so somebody has to specify it, but we've also seen, we haven't fully implemented it, but we've had a bunch of people ask about, um, they've extended Swagger a little bit. Like Swagger has an extension mechanism as part of the spec. Um, so they've kind of overloaded it a little bit and they put some security and kind of routing rules as part of the definition, and they've asked us, we haven't fully implemented it yet, um, so that we can interpret those extra comments in Swagger to automa automatically generate the, the route definitions, the route rules, more the security side, who's allowed to do what, um, based on those definitions. Because they found, for them, they found it easier to do the, the API governance through Swagger, and if they could kind of keep those extra bits there, it was, an e and we've heard it from a bunch of people, so it's, I think it's a somewhat common pattern. Um, and so we're trying to figure out if there's a way we can kind of automate the translation from those. The problem is that they're not standard, but it's like how can we take what's sort of a, a relatively common pattern and translate that to a virtual service? Are these annotations or YAML attributes? It's a little both. I, I seen them. So that's the problem is that people, so we're, we're trying to dance a little bit because it's, it's, it's kind of part of the standard, but kind of not. But we, we've heard at least five people ask, five different companies ask for something like that. So we're trying to figure out is there enough commonality there that we can build that in and maybe put a little, a couple of uh, extension hooks there so we can say, hey, we'll take it 80% and then you've got to put a little bit of code in here to get us the last bit. I don't know how it's going to end up. We're, like I said, we're playing with it. So I'd like to understand how they do that because it's what they need to do. Specify the endpoints with the different endpoints. Uh, you don't have the backends. Yeah. So if we get that implemented, I'll, I'll, so I'll talk to Carol. We'll figure out another tour up through Canvas. But in but in all of these cases, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we do something yeah. along those lines. Yeah. But in all these cases, there's still a human being that's deciding what these rules are. I don't think we've gotten to the point where you know, someone's going to magically figure out routing rules. For example, you know, there's a case when you can deliver the daily 
daily uh, uh, Push, features, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Then we don't want someone to stay there and find its rules, right? Well, so new version will be. I think you're touching on a different thing. So there's a there's a which I didn't touch on. So Glue itself can deal with. You can have multiple virtual service definitions. Right. So you could have for your team is dealing with these three microservices, right? You know, we're in the two pizza box land, right? So you're dealing with that. You can have your own virtual service definition to say here are the routes for my yeah, services for and the how they service, and how they fit it. into a certain domain. So you could. Um, Captio Contour does some of this, so they've got a really interesting model in their Envoy-based proxy where um, they'll do, um, they've built a delegation model to their virtual service interface, which is really cool and we're trying to mimic it um, a little bit. Um, so they actually, you can have like IT could basically say like, hey Slash, like the, the root path is special, that's corporate, but you're part of marketing. So Slash marketing is kind of your domain and you can do anything you want with the subdomains on that. And so all of your services, and then you can have your own set of virtual services that kind of divvy up the slash underneath slash marketing. So it gives you delegation and you're, it's granular and you change it, but other people could be changing slash sales and slash development independent of you, but there's kind of a governance because they can set, um, use our back to basically say, hey, you can only do this, but you can't touch slash sales. I don't agree. In my case, I was talking about the same service, the same virtual service. When I do several yeah. points a day, the same, to the same. Uh, yeah, only if the routing rules change. But at some point, somebody's going to something's going to change that. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to code gen that, if you've got some flow and some other spec, I mean, you could do that. But I mean, my head, that's still a person did something, and it's just being translated to a service. But you, you, you have the different versions for each new yeah. uh, batch, to them. Canary, the virtual, to right. the, the, just the, the virtual the service is a custom resource, so it's just yeah. it's another code artifact that can be deployed with your application. Another so. question: Do you support the um, uh, configuration? With Glue? No, not at, at this point. I mean, we don't explicitly not support it, but it's like we haven't done any work around Kube uh, Federation per se. We we are doing some work with Service Mesh Federation. Um, which there isn't a spec on that. So in because the context of the same cluster or uh, different cluster? Multi-cluster. Multi so um, that's a very common use case we're seeing is that even if people aren't necessarily dealing with multiple service mesh implementations, they've got a lot of people have many different clusters or they've got some in the cloud, some on-prem, and they're like, how do I keep the different version, the, the different deployments of Istio? Istio tends to be the biggie, the one winner on this case, but uh, how do I keep those in sync? Uh, you know, and dealing with you know whatever part of my total universe, you know, how do I how do I kind of manage that? And because we've got uh, this kind of push architecture, when a policy happens, we translate and push it, and we've got an ability to kind of know what that state is. Um, I think that kind of a federated model works well for a service mesh. And the service mesh is actually doing the implementation of it, and only when it changes do we kind of hop in and go do it. Which means we don't you don't have to have a fast network. You don't have to have a necessarily reliable network. It'll keep whatever the last configuration is sane um, and do that. Istio is trying to do some of that themselves. The Istio project is trying to create the sort of one control plane to rule them all across clusters. Um, but we've heard feedback from a bunch of people that that's not worked well because all of the Istio deployments have to be the identical version. You have to guarantee a flat networking space across all of your clusters so there can be no overlapping IPs in your cluster. Good luck trying to do that. That's a really hard thing to do. Um, can do it, it's just really hard. And there's sync problems they're facing that as soon as if they have any kind of network hiccup, there there's partitions that are going out that they haven't figured out how to recover from. So it's just, it's, it's they may solve it, but it's a really hard problem to do. And we, we just kind of feel like this kind of loosely coupled push federation model works better and kind of solves the, the main problem people are looking at. So that's, we're putting some effort towards that. There isn't a, a coup sig around that yet, but I mean, Istio itself is kind of off on the side of the coop sinks right now, so we'll see how that plays out. Cool. Uh, not sure if I capture all the details in the architecture. Do you support Docker if you don't want to go yeah. Kubernetes? Yeah. Oh. So we've got examples. You can use Docker Compose to pull these things together. You can deploy Glue itself um, with static files. So we've got some people that do it with static files, some people using console to drive it as a storage engine either standalone binaries or a Docker. Uh, I mean, all those 
I mean, we're deploying containers, right? They're all Docker containers that we're deploying in Kubernetes, so it's easy to run those containers outside. So, in fact, we had one guy, Chen Witt, what's his last name? Oh, I forget. He was one of the Docker uh, champions. Um, he just did a whole write up on that, um, on using just Docker, like Docker, Docker Swarm to deploy Glue, which is kind of cool. Yeah. So. Okay, I probably, well, I don't know, Carol's going to give me the, the yank at some point, but. <laughs> um, do you plan on having a la carte pricing for enterprise features? Well, you know, we'll look at how big your wallet is and we're happy to take it. <laughs> in, 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 in our case, we're, 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 we're looking specifically only for off C. For authentication? Uh, on the third. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we can talk about it offline. I mean, we're right now the pricing model we're looking at is sort of like API, and I defer to the salespeople around this, but you know, there's sort of a uh, number of API calls and there's sort of a tiered pricing model around some of those. Um, so, depending on your scenarios, and I can hook you up with the sales guys who can have that conversation. I'll get in trouble if I go too far down that path. But love that you're asking. <laughs> Thank you.